My name is Mary Gallagher. I taught at Montgomery College for 35 years before I retired a few years ago. I loved Montgomery College. I love teaching here, mainly because Montgomery College gets fantastic students. Our students come from everywhere, nearly every country in the world. But it's not just geographic diversity, it's also economic diversity, uh, religious, political, it's all there. Now, there are some people nowadays who don't, who downplay the value of diversity. But I know from my experiences that diversity is a source of strength, not a problem. So Montgomery College, with its diversity, has wonderful students. It also has, and here I'm a little biased, wonderful faculty. <laughs> um, but the thing that Montgomery College does not have is sometimes all of the extras that you find in Ivy League colleges, things that are often just a matter of money. Um, one of the trends now in higher education is to get students involved in research in the first couple of years of their college experience. We could spend two hours talking about the advantages, but please just think about it, and I think you'll see them. <clears throat> so my husband and I decided to set up a scholarship so that students at Montgomery College would have the same opportunities as students at the Ivy League schools. So we set up a rookie scholar scholarship program. And this panel this morning is an outgrowth of that. Um, these students, Nance, Musa, Alexi Werner, and their instructor um, are wonderful examples of how this can be used and useful. They have worked very hard all semester, and Maria Sprain, Dr. Sprain, has done a wonderful job of getting them ready and teaching them how to do this. And so I'm very proud uh, and honored to be able to introduce Dr. Maria Sprain and Nance Musa and Alexi Werner. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. And thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Um, thank you for the introduction, but also thank you for the many years of support and dedication to Montgomery College students, to anthropology, and to history. And this is a session where anthropology and history intersect. So it's uh, such a pleasure to be here on the Germantown campus of Montgomery College, which also happens to be the campus where I teach. And I think it's particularly fitting to be here presenting a historical perspective on immigration. Montgomery County today is unique among our nation's more than 3,000 counties. So 32% of our population in the county is foreign born. And as Dr. Gallagher has already pointed out, the students at MC hail from more than 160 different countries worldwide. And note that the county has four of the top 10 most diverse cities in the nation, including Germantown. A point I'd like to make today uh, with this panel is that this diversity has roots in the time period following World War II. Um, and all of the research uh, for the panel today, well, most of it was conducted last fall, and it was supported by the Montgomery College Rookie Research Grants um, and also Anthropology Matters Grant. Um, and it uh, came about after uh, some conversations with Matt Logan. In the aftermath of World War II, millions of people were displaced. 
During the two decades that followed, US immigration policies continued to favor the light-skinned Western and Northern European migrants. Restrictive immigration policies based on race and ethnicity kept people from Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and other regions out of the US. The national origins quota for immigration, in effect since the 1920s, limited immigration to 2% of the foreign born for each nationality as recorded in the 1890 census. There were some immigration laws of the 1950s and 1960s that allowed people to come to the US based on their circumstances um, that were caused by the war and also by the Cold War. But the quota system basically, um, based on nationality, was not replaced until 1965 uh, when the Immigration and Nation Nationality Act was signed. This is also known as the Hart Seller Act. And it replaced the quota system with one based on family relationships and to some degree skills. So if people had a, a job to come to or employers supported them. Um, as several studies have pointed out, this act really changed the demographics of the United States. So between 1945 and 1965, the diversity of the nation and the county begins to uh, increase, to change. And many immigrants came for jobs and opportunities to the Washington, D.C. area, including to the Montgomery County suburbs. And I've marked on this graph, 1945 and 1965, the foreign born and diverse peoples moving to the county were a small percentage, but overall significant relative to the surrounding metropolitan area. This cultural diversity has been relatively hidden, however, by government policies and perceptions of the general public, both stemming from racialized and ethnocentric worldviews. By 1960, Montgomery County had only slightly fewer foreign born than the district, in comparison to the rest of Maryland, even Baltimore City, the county had the highest percentage of foreign born. By the 1960, the greatest number of foreign stock, and this is the term used by the US Census, uh, were those folks from the USSR, from the UK, Germany, Canada, Italy, and Poland. Nationality alone does not reflect cultural and ethnic diversity. The languages spoken in the county provide a better idea of who was here by 1960. Note that there were more Spanish and Yiddish speakers than Russian, French, or Greek. And we'll hear more about the Yiddish speakers in a few minutes. Over the decades, various immigration laws, some rather ad hoc, allowed more diverse peoples into the US. In general, though, the policies favored the Northern and Western Europeans. The Refugee Act of 1953, for example, allowed up to 205,000 more people into the US. This would be over the, uh, over that which was already in place, um, these migrants were fleeing persecution or had been expelled from homes in Europe. The county would not be as diverse as it is without Washington, D.C., drawing migrants from across the nation and across the world. The government institutions, international organizations, embassies, and universities have brought temporary residents, but also people who, st who have stayed. So D.C. is uh, an important part of the county's immigration story. The divide between the county and D.C. in a sense is symbolic in terms of daily life. They're not separated by a river or mountains, um, and roads, bus routes, sidewalks link the two into a place where people cross easily to go to work, uh, to seek entertainment, um, to go to restaurants, um, and overall to construct a sense of belonging that crosses uh, that, that county line. And this is just an image of the hot shops in Chevy Chase in the early 1940s. Um, so the 1950s and 1960s saw impressive growth of the suburbs around Washington. And the people moving to the county were mostly white and affluent. Um, in contrast, DC became more impoverished and racially divided. And here's a chart you can see that in uh, Montgomery County in 1960, the foreign born were about uh, 4.5. Um, and today it's 32.6%, which is an increase that is much higher than the other surrounding counties and even in DC. So among those moving to the suburbs were the foreign born um, and the white foreign stock, to use the uh, terminology from the US Census. As Robert Manning has pointed out, during the 1950s, more African Americans moved to DC than to the suburbs. By 1960, 
the black population in the county was about 3%. So more foreign born than African American residents were living in the county by 1960. And I just wanted to point out that this picture um, is uh, one of Charlotte Caulfield, who was a longtime resident of Lightonsville in the county. Um, and it's really an important African community uh, today. So popular culture uh, during this time period was predominantly white popular culture. Um, and if we look at this culture from the 50s and 60s, it does show that uh, really ethnic and ancestral history was quite hidden. Um, a question that anthropologists ask is, um, you know, what country, city, or county welcomed immigrants? And if we're thinking about that period of 1945 to 1965, we can say they came to a segregated society that was dominated by policies and structures favoring people with lightly pigmented skin. In the 1950s, Leave it to Beaver, Father It Knows Best, The Twilight Zone were among the popular shows. Number one hits included those of Elvis Presley. By the way, I've always wanted to talk about Elvis in a speech, so here we go. Um, Patty Page and Perry Como. Ernest Hemingway uh, wins the Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes. The Howdy Doody Show was airing, and in 1964, the Beatles arrive. So from 1945 to 1965, popular culture was decidedly white, and a racial worldview predominated the thinking of the general public. The Washington, D.C. metro's areas, schools, facilities, housing, were segregated by law or by practice. While the U.S. government's message in the U.S. Census acknowledges that race is not a biological reality, it continued to use racial categories with the white and black dichotomy. And, it, and I've underlined it here. Um, it states in the 1960 census that the concept of race is derived from that which is commonly accepted by the general public. And it states that the term color refers to the division of the population into two groups, white and non-white. It's notable that, um, first of all, that there was a Chinese restaurant in Bethesda in 1960, um, but also in this advertisement for the Washington Post, the uh, restaurant is looking uh, for white or oriental waitresses. During these post-World War II decades, many migrants who had been able to enter the U.S. through various immigration policies applied, soon applied to become U.S. citizens in Montgomery County. And our research from last fall, uh, we found their stories archived in boxes at the Maryland State Archives. Um, we, in a sense, discovered these boxes filled with petitions for naturalization after scouring the Sween uh, Research Library for stories about immigration. In the library, uh, Nance, Lexi, and I came across a pamphlet from the Sixth Circuit Court in Rockville. And it had the names of people who were applying for citizenship during this time period, this 1958. Um, and the name uh, Dwayne Wang caught my attention, and I thought, gosh, this is uh, in the 1950s. Who is uh, Dwayne Wang? Well, as we uh, continue to do our research, uh, we found that these uh, petitions for naturalization are actually um, stored in boxes at the Maryland State Archives. So the petitions show that among the many migrants from England, Germany, and Canada applying for U.S. citizenship, there were also people like Dwayne and Emma Wang from China, uh, there were, uh, was a, a man from Trinidad, someone from Israel, Brazil, Korea, Mexico, China, Japan, Cuba, Guatemala, India, the Philippines, and uh, my favorite is San Miguel, El Salvador. We have a lot of people in the county from San Miguel, El Salvador. The migrants made the metropolitan area and the county their home and likely did become citizens. They lived mostly in Silver Spring, Bethesda, Tacoma Park, Chevy Chase, Rockville, and Kensington. Um, these, this was probably because of the proximity to uh, DC and also where the streetcars were running and the uh, bus routes, and that would have made transportation easier. The petitions for naturalization forms also included information about uh, the migrants' jobs, which is a really very interesting list. I'm not going to look at all of it here, but just note that there were neurosurgeons, um, a baker, a priest, microbiologists, secretaries, students, translators, and housewives. So a really diverse group of people. Uh, the box on the bottom is uh, the, one of the boxes that we found at the Maryland State Archives. So immigrants often maintain ties to former countries and cultures, 
a pattern that is prevalent today. Many were also able to maintain their cultural traditions and speak their first languages as they settled down, integrated, and became Americans. Today, we will hear uh, the specific stories about the stateless from the former Soviet Union. Uh, we'll hear about Yiddish speakers, and then we'll also hear about the Chinese community. So just a note, I, I just want to end by saying, uh, and this section, by, that sharing stories brings understanding, sometimes appreciation, and strengthens bonds. Our research on immigration has uncovered many stories. These stories are important. They are important for understanding immigration and migration today, for recognizing our own community's history and events that have led to our county's diverse, rich, and most interesting cultural presence. So I'd like to um, have Nance Musa come up and uh, start her presentation. Thank you, Professor. Um, my name's Nance, and I am going to be talking about the group of immigrants who came from Soviet-controlled areas. Um, to begin, I have a very, very brief summary of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, to compete with the expansion of Nazi Germany, the Communist Party of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic began taking over surrounding areas in Eastern Europe. Um, by 1960, more than 17,000 residents in Montgomery County had migrated from Soviet-controlled countries. Years of occupation caused the displacement of massive amounts of people, many of whom came to the United States in search of freedom, um, like those in this image of the, the ship, the General Black, leaving Germany in 1948. Once this diverse population from across Eastern Europe made it here, their white skin made integration easier, especially at the height of racial segregation, but their distinct identities were recorded and their representation is foreign stock on 1960 US census data, shown here, and I highlighted some of the countries of interest. Um, the census definition of foreign stock is the combination of the foreign-born population with members of the native population of foreign or mixed parentage. More importantly, the distinct languages, religions, and cultures of their homelands endured and today contribute to the cultural richness of one of the most diverse counties in the United States. Um, this is a graph created from 1960 census data from Montgomery County, Washington, D.C., and Baltimore City that shows, some of the, uh, that shows the number of speakers of some mother tongues from Soviet-controlled areas. And some of these languages are still being spoken and taught to a third generation today, nearly 60 years later. Um, original petitions for naturalization filed in Rockville, today archived at the Maryland State Archives in Annapolis, allowed us to see more about the kinds of people that were in the county and pursuing U.S. citizenship. The full document is on the right. Um, some, like the one shown, even had pictures of the petitioners. A sample taken of petitions filed in Rockville between 1945 to 1965 found 214 total immigrants from Soviet-controlled territories, 213, and... Um, 213 for individuals and one adoption. Among the sample, not, not all of them, but among it, um, some interesting snapshots of this group include separate petitions for members of seven families, 13 students, 38 individuals listed as stateless, and 55 housewives. Um, here is a closer look at some of the biographical info contained on these petitions. The sections that have been highlighted on the top petition Answer, I was born in and country of which I am a citizen, subject, or national separately. Um, so this petition shows how statelessness was recorded on these petitions. You see it says uh, stateless, formerly Hungary on the top. And while studying the sample, it became clear that statehood, an issue of legality, was not so precisely measured. Both petitions shown here were filed by Hungarians who entered the United States in 1949 and the Soviet-controlled Hungarian People's Republic was formally established that year in August. Um, so Mr. Kornfeld of the top petition entered the United States months before then in January and um, is listed here already stateless. Uh, but on the other hand, Mr. Ebner of the bottom petition, um, as you can see, entered months later in December and is still listed there as Hungarian. This chart was made from um, from the petition for naturalization sample and shows country of origin, so where the filers were born. By far, most of the petitions were filed by those born in Hungary, but a good number were from Latvia and Poland as well. Um, uh, some petitions also list country of origin as USSR. It's a small sliver, 1.9%, uh, which underscores the very complicated nature of the aftermath of war and subsequent occupation. 
While researching, we found the American Latvian Association, the central organization for all things Latvian American in the United States, just down the road in Rockville. Um, beside me in this photo, Anita Tarads, uh, she narrated some of her life in an oral history interview. She was also the head of that organization for several years. After living between displaced persons camps for seven years, Anita came to Washington, D.C. with her family in 1951 and moved to Montgomery County in 1972. Um, I wanted to play a clip from uh, the very beginning of our interview when Anita remembered the first day of her journey away from home at just 10 years old. October, October 3rd, 1944, I was standing on the deck of a German ship in Riga, Latvia, and uh, it was sort of, I don't know, uh, overcast day, it was raining a little bit, but everybody was on the deck. And when the ship started moving very slowly, they all started to sing the Latvian national anthem. And that was the second time in my life when I saw my mom cry. Because I had been so excited with going with the ship, God only knows where, I didn't care, but that was exciting. Mom was crying. The provisions of the Refugee Relief Act lasted from 1953 to 1956 and allowed people to escape oppression and come to the United States. This legislation uh, defined this population, those persecuted by the Soviets, as SKPs rather than refugees. The quotas established by the Refugee Relief Act accounted for uh, 45,000 immigrant visas to be issued to those who escaped Soviet territories. But not all immigrants came as refugees or SKPs. Through Anita, we learned about Egon Goldschmitz, still in Montgomery County today, who migrated from Latvia under the Lodge Philbin Act. This legislation was designed to enlist 2,500 single, qualified single male aliens over 18 into the Army and grant them citizenship after five years of service. Um, the New York Times article on the right is about the naturalization of 11 men who qualified under this legislation. The highlighted section reads, all but three members of the group asked that their names not be revealed. They explained that they had relatives behind the Iron Curtain and feared Soviet reprisals. Um, regardless of the means of admission, though, all immigrants had to be sponsored in some form, like by the military or a U.S. citizen. And in this uh, second clip from our oral history interview with Anita Tarad, she explains how her family was sponsored. So, we had difficult times trying to find a sponsor. And this Latvian pastor, he was a Baptist pastor. He had been in the States in the I don't know, 20s or something like that. Mm -hmm. He realized that there were all kinds of people like us, and he decided to sponsor, help find sponsors for those families. And uh, that's how it came. And our first stop was at his house, which was kind of a rather big building in the Adupan Circle. And unfortunately, it's been torn down now. And uh, we're laughing, okay, from one DP camp in Germany to another one in, in the United States, <laughs> because we're about 25, 30 families squeezed, wow. squeezed in together. Wow. And he let us stay until the time we, uh, everybody found work and a place to live. Okay. And that was okay. perfect. Right. On those displaced by statelessness, the United Nations Refugee Agency says, today at least 10 million people around the world are denied a nationality. As a result, they often aren't allowed to go to school, see a doctor, get a job, open a bank account, buy a house, or even get married. Statelessness may occur for a variety of reasons, including discrimination against particular ethnic or religious groups, or on the basis of gender, the emergence of new states, and transfers between existing states, and conflict of nationality laws. Today, there are, uh, there are about 3,000 Latvians living in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area who continue to build community and contribute to the richness of the county. 
and country. I took these photos in the Latvian Museum at the American Latvian Association in Rockville, which is a wonderful place to visit to learn more about Latvian history and culture, how traditions like mitten making are practiced back home and here in the United States in Montgomery County, a world away. Um, next, we're going to hear from Lexi Werner about Yiddish speakers in Montgomery County. Thank you, Nance. Um, hello, my name is Lexi Werner, and I will be discussing post-war immigration of Yiddish speakers into Montgomery County, Maryland. The first thing which must be addressed when <laughs> discussing the immigration of Yiddish speakers is this looming question of what is Yiddish? Yiddish is a conglomeration of languages, mainly German and Aramaic, with lettering which draws heavily from Hebrew. Some linguists consider it a language, others consider it a dialect of German or Aramaic. Yiddish developed throughout the 9th and 10th centuries in Central and Eastern Europe and was used as a common language among Jewish communities with diverse backgrounds. It has had several names throughout history, but my favorite of them is Mauscheldeutsch, which roughly translates to Moses German. Now, who speaks Yiddish? Because Yiddish was and is still used largely as an in-group language, many Yiddish speakers also speak other languages depending on their country of residence. That said, not all Yiddish speakers are Jewish, and further, not all Jewish people, Jewish people speak Yiddish. Because Yiddish is also not specific to one country, it becomes incredibly difficult to trace speakers through nationality. Especially after World War II, hesitancy to speak Yiddish outside of the home or to record Yiddish on legal paperwork increased. U.S. naturalization petition number 650 filed in Rockville, Maryland is an example of the types of inconsistencies that arise from government paperwork. While many people today question whether Judaism is a religion or an ethnicity or both, uh, on February 25th of 1949, Eva Lena Goodstein's paperwork firmly declared Jewish to be a nationality, as you can see highlighted on this petition here. In 1944, President Roosevelt established the War Refugee Board, which sought to bring Jewish refugees into the United States under great pressure from existing communities of Jewish immigrants. Among the 137,450 Jewish refugees brought to the US, 100,000 of these people were considered Jewish displaced persons, having no home to return to amidst the ongoing war. Evelina Goodstein was likely one of these displaced persons, unable to claim a nationality aside from her Jewish identity. In the United States, many of these displaced peoples found a home. Between the 1950s and 1960s, many Jews immigrated, migrated from DC to Montgomery County, likely among them a fair amount of Yiddish speakers. The 1960 US census data shows a large number of Yiddish speakers um, immigrating into Montgomery County. In fact, in 1960, Yiddish was actually the fifth most spoken language amongst foreign-born immigrants in DC. Montgomery County alone had 750 Yiddish-speaking foreign-born immigrants recorded in the 1960 census forms. Even if this was a number of families at five members per household, that remains a total of 150 households speaking Yiddish. This is a relatively high number of foreign-born Yiddish-speaking immigrants actively recording Yiddish as their mother tongue or first language on census surveys. When compared to the surrounding DC suburb counties, Montgomery County remains surprisingly high. Even Prince George's County, as we can see, comes in at only 329 Yiddish speakers, despite it being adjacent to DC. In contrast, of course, Baltimore City, which is not included on this chart, had well over 6,000 Yiddish-speaking immigrants. This makes sense because Baltimore is a port city. So why Montgomery County? Although Jewish population growth in DC metro area for many is associated with the 1960s, Jews from Eastern Europe began immigrating and grow to the growing Washington DC area as early as the 1870s. Though in 1878, there were only 1,500 Jews in DC, by 1918, the population had grown to 10,000. In contrast to larger cities, which many opportunities for physical labor, 
Much of the growing Washington, D.C. area was tied to the government or government contractors, and thus, those who immigrated here were often more Americanized than their labor or counterparts, many of whom lived in Jewish concentrated areas and worked in Yiddish-speaking factories in larger cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Seeking largely to take advantage of the growing city and become merchants and business owners, opening shops in the district as early as the 1930s. According to authors Hasia and Stephen Diner, during and after World War II, Washington's Jewish population continued to grow rapidly, reaching about 40,000 by 1956. The Jewish Community Council published The Jewish Population of Greater Washington in 1956, it's the title, <laughs> which noted that district Jews were concentrated in four separate areas. Washington Jews were relatively affluent, highly educated, and strongly involved in both the Jewish and the larger Washington communities. A peak can be seen of Yiddish speakers in DC in 1930. As DC grows due to the expanding federal government, so does the Jewish population and its Yiddish speakers. At nearly 5,000 by this time, followed by a continual drop in the population. Now, here is an advertisement for a Yiddish theater company in Washington, D.C. And so this really shows how the Yiddish-speaking population in the metropolitan area, including Montgomery County, was large enough to continually support such a niche business with their patronage as a Yiddish theater with a musical laugh riot. In the early 1900s, there remained intact racially restrictive covenants for housing for both African Americans and Jews alike. As these restrictions were lifted, those who were previously bound to their existing racially concentrated neighborhoods were given freedom to move throughout the area. By the time the restrictions were lifted, Montgomery County had already had a foundation of a Jewish community, and the newcomers from DC added to the flourishing area. Here, there is an example of Jewish activities taking place in this Washington Post article from 1958 titled, MCJC's Women Council, They Make Dough for Building Fund. Here it is evident by both the fact that there is an active Jewish women's council and that the community is mainstreamed enough for this post uh, with Jewish recipes to be featured in a popular regional newspaper that the community was indeed both large and undeniably recognized. Again, in this article from 1962, uh, there is a fifth established annual Jewish event advertised alongside a Kanish recipe, which, for those of you who don't know, is essentially mashed potato in a pastry dough. It's delicious. I would highly recommend it. Um, published again in the Washington Post. That is not to say that there were not challenges faced with this growing community. There have been several accounts of discrimination throughout the early and mid-1900s by the Chevy Chase Land Company and others. In fact, in a 1916 brochure, um, the company advertised that they would protect property holders against the encroachment of undesirable elements. This had been used at the time as a sig to signal a barrier between the housing built by Chevy Chase Land Company and those of African American and Jewish descent, as well as other non-white descents. Jewish developers such as Sam Eig played an integral role in developing the Jewish community. In an oral history interview, Sam Eig recounted his own experience of trouble obtaining loans to develop areas in Silver Spring and Rockville, as well as, as pushback from other developers telling him to keep the area Christian. When he was told by another develop, developer that he would be unable to just sell houses, that he had to sell a community with schools and churches, Sam Eig thought, well, I can build churches and proceeded to spend years investing in the foundation of local synagogues. In fact, the rising number of synagogues in the DC metropolitan area contributed additionally to drawing new community members who sought to attend synagogues with those closest to their own home communities. Some Jews may have, and may still to this day, travel quite a distance to attend a synagogue built by Jews from the same village, of them in Europe or from a similar observational sect as them. 
This is an image of the Jewish Washington Week newspaper um, from 1987, but the newspaper was actually founded in DC in 1930. Jewish Washington Week has persevered throughout the decades, serving the Jewish community, surely including Yiddish speakers of the DC metropolitan area. By 1970, the US census recorded more than 1.5 million Yiddish speakers nationwide. The US born Yiddish speakers outnumbered foreign-born Yiddish speakers by two to one, showing the importance to many US citizens of maintaining Yiddish and passing it on to the next generation. Now, according to US census data, by the year 1970, there were 27,432 Yiddish speakers in the DC metro area. That's less than 1% of DC's total population at the time, and of these, only 4,104 were foreign born. Now for comparison, listed here are the seven most commonly spoken languages in the DC metropolitan area according to the 1970 census data. English comes in, of course, at almost 83% of the population, followed next by German at less than 2%. Spanish, Italian, and French follow all just above 1%, followed by Yiddish at 0.96%, and the next most spoken language after Yiddish is actually Greek at 0.36%. So just for comparison, while Yiddish speakers were not a large part of the population, this is still a large number of Yiddish speakers concentrated in one area. As of 2015, recorded Yiddish speakers in Montgomery County are a mere 351, or 0.03% of non-English speakers. Yet the Jewish community of the county and the DC metropolitan area continues to thrive. Um, they're just, these are just a few of many communities in existence as resources for Montgomery County's Jewish community, which continues to grow. And several local universities continue to teach uh, Yiddish classes as well. Thank you. Uh, now we'll actually hear from Professor Maria Spren about uh, Chinese immigration into the county. So uh, today, uh, Chinese is the third most spoken language in Montgomery County after, Chinese, after English and Spanish. In 2014, Xi'an became Montgomery County's sister city in China. And numerous organizations, schools, and uh, clubs have become part of the multicultural fabric of the county. The history of the Chinese community in the county can be traced back to DC's Chinatown, which began in the 1880s. Interestingly, the first Chinese resident, though, was recorded in 1851. As sociologist Esther Chow states, the formation of a Chinatown in Washington, as in other major cities, was primarily a self-defense mechanism. Prevailing discrimination, racial tension, and economic hardship led early Chinese Americans to form distinctly ethnic enclaves to protect themselves from the larger, mostly hostile society. Most of the early Chinese immigrants came to the US after economic, political, and social troubles increased in China in the early 19th century. Mostly men, these migrants worked for low wages in undesirable jobs, including those in the railroad industry. Fueled by an economic recession and search for scapegoats, anti-Chinese sentiment increases in the later 19th century. Uh, this 1880 uh, series of cartoons uh, demonstrates public opinion and uh, general stereotypes about Chinese migration to the US. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was signed, and it stalled migration from China to the US until 1943 when it was repealed. During these 61 years of exclusion, the families, including wives of the Chinese men already in the United States, were banned from entry. In addition, those already in the US could not gain citizenship. Anti-immigrant sentiment, though focused on people migrating from China, was also directed at other groups. And here is a cartoon from 1882 showing two Irishmen discussing the possibility of being the next to be excluded. And it says, Fritz to Pat, if the Yankee Congress can keep the yellow man out, what is to hinder them from keeping us green, uh, and calling us green and keeping us out too? In Washington, D.C., as in other cities, Chinese immigrants were excluded from many economic opportunities, in part due to their sometimes ambiguous and often clearly non-white racial status. 
The entrepreneurial spirit of many Chinese immigrants, however, resulted in the opening of many businesses to serve their own communities as well as patrons beyond their, beyond their neighborhoods. In DC, many of the early Chinese immigrants ran laundry businesses and restaurants throughout the city. In the 1940s, uh, the war with Japan and uh, the general circumstances of World War II changed public sentiment to be more favorable toward Chinese migrants. Immigration restrictions were lifted as the US relationship with China improved. It is telling, however, that in the 1950 US Census, people of Chinese ancestry were considered non-white, grouped with Indians and Japanese, and that's in quotes, for government counting. The census, reports, the census report shows, thank you, uh, 78 people of Chinese ancestry, 42 males and 34 females living in Montgomery County. In addition, as Esther Chow highlights, the general public did not distinguish between nationalities from Asian countries. Many Chinese businesses prominently displayed American flags and other overt symbols of the US to clearly demonstrate that they were not Japanese. Following World War II, DC's Chinatown grew and changed. During this time, Chinese hand laundries were taken over by automatic laundry businesses, in-home washing machines, and low maintenance fabrics like polyester came into style. In contrast, Chinese restaurants um, and Chinese cuisine became very popular. In addition to economic migrants, specialized professionals also came from China to the DC area, including Montgomery County. Uh, this is an image of Dr. C.K. Liang, a senior chemist who worked at the NIH in the 1940s. Um, and he was sent by the Chinese government under the auspices of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration to do research and study post-war problems. It is also in the decades following World War II that American-born Chinese and those recently arrived built strong communities with many institutions and social groups in DC and in Montgomery County. Today, these social and cultural bonds and institutions continue to play an important, an important role for the metropolitan area's Chinese community. Here in this slide, I'll, uh, I just wanna point out that uh, on the left side is DC and the far side is Baltimore and you can see that the red bar is the um, numbers in 1950 and the green is 1960. And you can see that people are moving away from the cities and into the counties. And these are uh, numbers of Chinese residents. Uh, people emigrated from China for various reasons and for different uh, circumstances. In the 1950s, wealthier families with education, students, some displaced while uh, studying outside of China and refugees fleeing China for political freedom came to the US. Here's the petition of uh, Duane Wang from Shanghai who I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, program and he lived on uh, Bradley Boulevard in Bethesda. And I'm just gonna end uh, with a, a, sh a story um, based on the Lee family. So Montgomery uh, County resident um, Art Ping Lee shown here came to DC in 1936. And in a very generous uh, oral history interview, he narrated his story about immigration. He mentioned that he was unable to find a job or make a living in China because there was no industry in Taishan, Canton. During the conflict in China, um, he was here in the DC area, however, and he mentioned that he didn't know whether his parents had food or if they were safe. Um, there was no mail service at the time and no long distance phone calls. In 1945, he learned that his mother had survived but his father had passed away during the war. During the time while he was in DC, he went into the laundry business. His first uh, laundry was a hand laundry on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, he did go back to China, he got married and came back with a son. Um, and this is, uh, by 1955, he had bought a larger laundry business that used washers and dryers and presses and folding equipment. And he uh, told us that uh, he employed 10 people. They were all African-American men and women. And that this was a larger business that also had a truck that would help other businesses with their laundry. So in 1960, um, so just to say, uh, there's 197 Chinese speakers in Montgomery County in 1960, and this is the year that the Lee family moves to Silver Spring. So they were one of the few families living in Montgomery County at that time. Um, and they moved to a suburban house with pink siding, um, and this is their new home outside of the city. By 1962, Mr. Lee was in the restaurant business. He became one of the many partners in the Tai Tong restaurant. He was the chairman and business was good. And he mentioned that every year the restaurant handed out bonuses to its employees. 
Then by 1972, he opened a new restaurant, the Golden Palace, where he had, as he mentioned, only chefs from Hong Kong and decorations from Taiwan. The hostesses wore traditional Chinese-style dresses, and the floor captains wore tuxedos. <laughs> um, and uh, later on, President Clinton was one of his customers, um, and the Washington Post uh, gave the restaurant uh, four stars for food and for service, and that was the top ranking. He was very proud of that. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, second generation and recent arrivals from China moved um, from Chinatown to the suburbs as well. Here, like in the city, they enjoyed the proximity of family, new social networks, community events, and financial support. They also maintained their close connections to the city and still do today with regular visits to Chinatown. I'm impressed with and admittedly envious by how today many of the clubs, associations, religious institutions, community bonds, and friendships among families that began with the first generation of migrants from China to DC have endured. They've endured through the 1950s um, and that, the migrations during that time to the suburbs. And this is an image of the Chinese Youth Club of Washington, D.C. And um, one of the boys in this picture is Mr. Lee's son. And this is Mr. Art Ping Lee today. He was the founder of the Chinese Youth, Youth Club, which was established in 1939. And this year, Mr. Lee celebrates his 104th birthday. <sighs> Earlier this month, when asked during an oral history interview, interview what he would say to future generations, he mentioned that he would like to share his experiences about the war, the restaurant business, and helping immigrants. He also mentioned his six kids, seven grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And his advice for future generations was this, get involved in your community organizations and appreciate living in a free country.